Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to Asher User Group Sweden. Uh, I'm Jonah, and here with me is Hokan. Hi, Hokan. Hello, Jonah. Hi. How are you this morning? I'm great. Uh, it's a sunny winter day here in my side in, in the mid north of Sweden. It looks like you have a very nice background uh, behind nice. you. <laughs> <laughs> it looks like you're outdoors, but indoors, right? <laughs> uh, it's, it's outdoors, but indoors. That's right. Yes, that's right. Yes. And hi, everyone, to our uh, community members and audience that uh, that are joining us today. And uh, we apologize that we were a few minutes late, but uh, we are we are here <laughs> to learn. And uh, before we get started, let me just introduce my uh, co-community leader, Hawkan Silver Nagel here. Um, he is uh, a Microsoft MVP for AI. He works at Miles as a manager for big data and AI, and he is also very active as an international speaker, a community leader of different communities in Oslo, AI42 and AI School, and even in Norwegian.net, and also uh, Azure User Group Sweden. So yes, so it's an honor to collaborate with Hokan for the past years in this uh, user group. Yes, and I also have the honor here to introduce Jonah. So Jonah Anderson is the founder of our user group. And in addition to that, she's a lot of other things. She's an Azure MVP. She is a blogger. She is a mentor. And she's also um, a podcaster. And she is a frequent speaker, both at, at meetups such as this, but also on big international conferences. And uh, she is working as a senior cloud and DevOps engineer. And uh, she's also an author. She's writing a book that will come out later this year. Right, Jonah? Yes, that's right. Learning Microsoft Azure uh, is uh, with Rayleigh. So I look forward to share it to the community when uh, it's out. So yes, thank you so much, Håkan, for the nice um, uh, introduction. Uh, good introduction to those that are new in joining us in our stream today. And uh, our, our guest speaker today is also uh, an MVP, Microsoft MVP. So there will be three MVPs on this stream today who will be sharing us about uh, Azure Databricks for engineers. And yes. before we bring him to stage and introduce him, let me just uh, remind everyone about our code of conduct for this uh, community. So we are, uh, we would like everyone to be respectful and be nice and friendly, uh, listen and be thoughtful, uh, seek to understand and not criticize others. Uh, if you have ideas and you're curious, ask questions or share and be inclusive in your comments or questions. Uh, if you have uh, questions or feedback of, of uh, our code of conduct, feel free to reach out to me and Hovkan on LinkedIn or Twitter, or you can also check out the GitHub link that you see on the screen right now. And uh, also, uh, we will be uh, sharing a, a learner badger uh, from Microsoft Azure Heroes. So, if you have your phones with you, you may uh, claim your or collect your learner badger from Azure Heroes. And on the left side, you, you all will also see a bit.ly link where you can find the learning path for Azure Data Bricks. So we will show this again later in case you're not able to catch up scanning this. And we should also say that you know you can ask questions at any time here during the session. Yes. But in addition to that, we are also um, uh, offering you a chance here to speak directly to our speaker after the session. So we will uh, arrange a Zoom meeting, so we call it uh, FICA. So that's a very informal meeting where you can speak to speak to the speaker and ask any further questions, or maybe you have some more detailed things that you want to discuss. Yes. Uh, so we will uh, uh, we will give that link out to you at the end of our session today. Yes, thank you. We do have uh, friends saying hi already. I see Hokan Aditya. We have Alan Strand from Oslo saying hi. And we also have Me Spice from <laughs> Sweden. <laughs> and also Stefan is saying hi. And also Tommy uh, saying hi. Welcome everyone for joining us uh, today. Yes. 
Yeah, so then I think it's time for us here to introduce our speaker for today. Yes. Uh, so let them may bring him on stage. Uh, meanwhile, I can do a formal introduction here. Yes, that's right. So we have Usama, Usama Wabab Khan. Uh, he is a Microsoft MVP and also a Microsoft Certified Trainer. And he's a community leader from uh, uh, UAE. And he's also working as a CTO at Evolution Technologies and is also an Azure community hero. Very, very well. Welcome, Usama. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Oscar and, and John, for inviting me here. And I uh, really appreciate that. Uh, you guys doing a good job. It will be an honor to be a part of this uh, great community. So good at their reach. If my Swedish is absolutely <laughs> terrible, so I was ready for that. And uh, it's, it's been a pleasure to see you guys at contributing a lot, not only for Sweden, even for the global community. We have learned a lot in this part of the world in UAE. We really have a kind of, kind of fan club for you guys. And we will hope so that you guys also visit us in some, some upcoming years. Uh, thank you. Yes. Thank you for inviting me. <laughs> yeah, that's great. Yes, uh, invite us in conferences there, <laughs> <laughs> and then vice versa. Yes, thank you so much for uh, yeah, uh, the good. Uh, uh, yeah. Uh, good uh, definitely. Uh, we oh, are okay. planning to just. Uh, so. Uh, so are we just planning to host a couple of uh, conferences in in Dubai and uh, middle of the uh, end of the quarter I think so or sorry end of the um, uh, I think the second quarter or the third quarter between and uh, definitely so we're going to host uh, both of you guys and uh, we're trying to bring all the community leaders because Dubai is becomes like an, uh, a giant hub for everyone the people come from different places the huge diversity you will find and the great sense of technology adoption. So nowadays we are crazy about chat GPT. You can sell chips mm -hmm. with chat, adding just the word chat GPT here. <laughs> so yes. we just have hosted uh, uh, artificial intelligence conference in, in Riyadh. And now we are replicating that one in Dubai. So shall we begin? Yes, let me yes. just bring in your presentation. Is your presentation ready? I'll show it to everyone. Let's mm -hmm. see. Okay. All right, you, the stage is yours, Osama. Thank you. Thank you, Th thank you, John. Thank you. So this is beautiful, Stockholm. And uh, first, one more time, thank you for bringing me here. And uh, good, good afternoon. Good energy, the strategies, if I'm saying it correctly. I hope so. So as I've been introduced, my name is Sama, and uh, I know this is a very long name. That's what we do in this part of the world. So you can just call me Sama, just forget about the rest. Uh, in short, I'm a developer, data scientist, love to do data engineering tasks, ML oops, and uh, love to travel. Father of two beautiful, gorgeous daughters. I just missed the one photo. And uh, contributing in Microsoft community from last 20 years. It's been 20 years, yes, it's been so far. So far, published a couple of books and... Uh, um, and collaborate with the amazing uh, community fellows across the globe and give me an opportunity uh, through my MVP title that interacts with an uh, audience uh, across the nations out there, across the globe out there. Very proud fellow of MCT community. I think so it's more than enough. And then do MIT. <coughs> so as you guys know from the title of this uh, presentation, this particular presentation is or today's session is heavily focused on one specific task of data engineering. As a data engineers, we basically work uh, with several of areas. Data engineering is like a Swiss knife, like a Swiss knife that has lots of tools to bring it out there. And one of the most important common tool that uh, you see, if you ask me today, that's one of the prime goal or prime task of uh, focal task of a data engineers is ETL processing. <laughs> data engineers are responsible for some advanced task, implementing data security, implementing integrating with the solution architecture, collaborating with other roles in a project. Also establishing infrastructure to basically support all those kind of analytical processing that might need it to be produced for data science or data analytics teams. But the more often and the more important task that you have seen that will be basically end up in the basket of data engineers is ETL processing. 
And today we're going to talk about how we can use Azure Databricks in order to build modern and scalable data pipelines. <clears throat> that is huge. Um, and we are generating data on an exponential speed nowadays. If you might be surprised that the, all the data that we have in this world till now, 85% of the data, 85% of the data has been generated in the last two years. It's it's really mind boggling that the, all the data that we able to collect till the whole the history of mankind, the 80% of the data has been collected in the last two years, and which include Panay. So it's really <clears throat> amazing to see that how fast and how quickly we are generating data, how much data we are generating and able to process. <clears throat> so <clears throat> I quickly, first of all, <clears throat> start with another, some fundamental concepts. Then I'll just dive towards uh, ETL processing and what uh, this whole fuzz is all about. And now you guys are thinking I heard about the chat GTP in large modules. So <clears throat> all those machine learning models, all those analytical solutions is start with the data where it's actually score, where it's reside in some other systems, some ERP, some softwares, and uh, or some random resources in a structured, structured form, <clears throat> which is absolutely not usable. We, as a data engineers, extract those data that their source systems will not have a load when we are trying to use them and will not affect their integrity. We extract them from an original source, dump them on a staging, and then transform it transform it to make it usable for target. This target is a load situation out there. This target, it can be a data set available for machine learning model training. Um, it can be available for <clears throat> some other kind of advanced analytics that can be done by data analyst teams out there for graphics and uh, for visualization and the Power BI kind of things going on with it. Or it can be available for even driven mechanisms to furthermore analyze in other applications. <clears throat> So once data has been loaded, it's available in its uh, most purest form that can be easily QD, that can be easily accessed, it can be easily used for business rules out there. So ETL stands for Extract Transform Load. <laughs> Extract Transform Load Pipeline collect data from various sources, ERP, source systems, file systems, uh, batch processes, and even nowadays we are collecting real-time data as well. And then we transform them according to business rules to load data into destination store out there. That can be data warehouse, that can be, might be in much in memory tables, or that can be, might be in some database that can be available for just structure and some, some kind of file format where that machine learning can take in place. <coughs> so literally, this piece is keep going on out there. And I really uh, like to talk about that, and uh, I'll keep tweeting about uh, how you and I can use this these tools in order to uh, improve the other segments as well. So I do have uh, information available about how you can work with an ETL, and uh, so Microsoft has a very detailed uh, course path available. So end of the course through GitHub, Johan, and again going to share the information with you guys that you can learn more about as well. Since we move on a cloud, things have changed. In past, we done lots of ETL. Thing. We try to extract the data from ERP systems, databases, and file systems, and then basically put them on a staging. And then we apply load. Normally, it happens with the structured data. When the data size are not that exponentially bigger or the large that what we have today. And uh, the velocity is also very similar at the same time. Now, the data is coming from so much variety. Data is coming on so much velocity. The velocity can be very in a very high or in very low. So latency can be possible. At the same time, <clears throat> the computation cost. <laughs> Since data is among us, we try to store those data in a distributed architectures like HDFS, or Hadoop, data lakes kind of architecture, where data is being dispersed across multiple nodes. <laughs> And then we basically load them and apply transformation. To apply transformation on these distributed nodes, we have to collect back the data when was before we extract it. So first we extract, we dump in a staging, and then we collect again to apply transformation. And after transforming it, we put them into the actual stores for the load out there. <clears throat> in order to optimize that process, especially in a context of big data, we moved from ETL to ELT 
where we are extracting the data and load them in memory and apply multiple transformation at once and make our data more refined, make it usable according to business rules so it can be compatible with the destination, with the target for machine learning, for analytics, or whatever the purpose of that data need to be served, reporting, and et cetera. <clears throat> and that whole concept has been reimagined in a concept of ELT. It's a very, very confusing terms out there. The process will still remain uh, similar, but not the same, because here we try to extract the data and load them in fast memory, and then we try to perform transformation. Because it's already loaded, it gave us a capability that we can apply multiple transformation without rewriting it out, without uh, need of reading again and again <coughs> in a Hadoop, <coughs> in a big data architecture. We basically get the data and put them in smaller nodes. And every time when we have to apply transformation, we collect data from different nodes, apply one change and write it back and then wait for the next change to be applied on it. And then we collect it again and change and then put it back which is time consuming, cost, uh, cost heavy, and there are lots of limitations around that. This module of ELT really transformed the way we walk and how fast we can walk out. <coughs> if we try to imagine the today's modern data pipeline, so this is the one simple reference architecture that can give you a little idea that what this is all about. If you want to imagine that thing in a world of cloud, is specifically Azure, uh, we are now dealing with the data that's coming from structure sources that can be like databases, applications, and also some log files, some telemetry, some media files, even some image files nowadays. And we use the data for the first thing is we need is we need to ingest the data. <clears throat> so we're using various tools nowadays. Most common tool that you use in Azure is a data orchestration engine that we call uh, Data Factory. It's a big brother of SSIS or Informatica that lives in a cloud scalable service. Anybody can use this <coughs> to build even codeless pipelines. Even the codeless pipelines are possible. And uh, this is a graphical interface for designing data pipeline and monitor them. It helps you to connect multiple kind of components out there. So once you extract the data, it has a built-in quality is so built-in facilities available that can help you to ingest data from various endpoints. <coughs> And then Microsoft have a very scalable store for data analytics or a heart and soul of data analytics. It's Azure Data Lake Storage, radical, massive object store, <coughs> massive scalable object store, designed and optimized for data analytics. And here our engine, our beloved engine, Databricks comes in. Because since the Azure Data Lake is a Hadoop compatible, they can also talk to Spark. The Best part of the Spark is that Spark can bring the in-memory processing power with multi-distributed cluster architecture at a very high scale. Regardless of amount and size of data that you're dealing, Spark can really can play a very vital role. And because of its in-memory processing, we can do ELT kind of things out here. And once we're able to load the data and transform it, then we can put the data back into either uh, <coughs> Microsoft Synapse Analytics <laughs> Also, then you can use the serving layer. Uh, we can directly ship the data to Power BI, in fact, from Databricks. So Power BI also have an integration available with the Databricks to analyze data from uh, Delta tables. And uh, also for the applications where we want to just ship more information, we can write data into Cosmos DB as well. And this is just fan out concept. <coughs> so it can just literally fan out. So this is just what modern pipeline can look like out there. And here we're going to do a training. Here we're going to do a preparation. Here we're going to do the analytics. So this tool is basically provide us a of components. And <coughs> Databricks, what it is and how it works, we're going to talk, talk about it in details, but we have to see the role of Databricks in a, in a field engineering, out in, in, in data field engineering out there. So data bricks basically help us to load data and uh, basically when coming from ingestion software. So ingestion tools such as uh, Event Hub for the real-time processing and for the batch processing tools like uh, Data Factory can help us to get the data. And then they have a modern concept of lake house where we're trying to refine data on different stages and make it more easy, accessible, and servable stage out there. <coughs> It's an evolution of a Lambda architecture. 
So the first stage is basically ingest where the data has been come out from our sources. Second, it's been stored. In real-time processing, it's just stored in memory. And inside the data factory, we're just putting them either into uh, some raw, raw stage out there. When I say raw stage, it means that I can put them into in a form of <coughs> data lake. And then <coughs> second level of transformation is raw. So we do a twitching here, we do a transformation, we remove the errors, we remove uh, the data that is not required. So we try to clean the data. So removing errors, cleaning errors, removing columns, making more flatten, creating a more tabular structures, uh, scaffolding of data, try to remove uh, data types that are not relevant, try to optimize data types, correct the formats. So we try to shaping the data enhancement or enrichment of data out there. Once data is being enriched, <coughs> then the second process kicked in, which basically called the gold layer. So it's basically divided into three layers in the Delta Lake architecture on Delta front, that called bronze, silver, and gold. In the gold layer, it's a more aggregated form. So we basically perform advanced aggregation, the calculations, you can say, if, you, if I simplify, we aggregated data. So once it's aggregated, it's pre-computed. So it becomes much more faster and easier to serve and accessible in applications like Power BI. So that's what the modern pipelines look like. <coughs> then second question pops up in your mind. <coughs> Sorry. <coughs> what is Databricks? These guys keep talking about the ETL and Databricks. We came here to just learn what is Databricks. So you guys have seen that. What's the role of Databricks in the life of data engineer? We love Spark. The reason that we love Databricks, it's Spark. Actually, it's not Databricks itself. It's Spark itself. That is really tempting. That requires us uh, or provides the power to run a uh, in-memory data processing. <clears throat> so, Databricks is basically a open source or kind of tool, or I can say the third-party tool out there. <laughs> okay, it's not Microsoft proprietary uh, product. So, Databricks, it's a kind of a tool that can be used by multiple teams. The main advantage of a Databricks, it gives you a serverless addition. It gives you serverless addition of uh, Spark, <coughs> which means you're not managing the servers out there. You're just able to access uh, Spark directly. It simplifies the deployment and management out there. It's been built by the same team who built Apache Spark but it's more premium and the more advanced. They're able to click and create a workflow management systems, which means that you just click once and able to create a whole Spark cluster and simplify your interaction with the Spark out there, that how you can write code, how you can submit your code, how you can run your code on it, how you can submit your jobs. It provides you native integration with the different file systems. So you can it becomes easier to read and write data in very optimal framework. It provides interactive workspaces and notebooks where developers, data scientists, data engineers, business analysts, data analysts can collaborate on a single platform. So data analysts can basically use the aggregated data to build reports and dashboards, even if possible directly inside the Databricks by using the multiple libraries like Panda <coughs> and building graphs and charts capability in notebooks. Data engineers can use a Spark SQL Python based code work, uh, notebooks to transform data. And also, data scientists can be here at the same time in a single platform, so unified platform, to allow them to use a refined data to build their machine learning model by using Spark Power where they are, by using Spark MLLib libraries. So the most framework uh, are already available. Then, Databricks try to connect with the Microsoft. They try to friends with Microsoft. Microsoft brings their own cloud goodness. So you get the infrastructural goodness, first of all. So you get the complete support of infrastructure as service beneath that. So all the Azure virtual machines, virtual networks, and integration with their, their networking components and encryption power and on-demand compute will be at your disposal. Great integration with Microsoft's own product, such as Cosmos DB, Azure SQL, uh, and also uh, Synapse. <coughs> data factory <coughs> very enterprise grade SLA and integration with authentication and authorization by using Azure Active Directory <coughs> which make Databricks super awesome too it allow you 
to integrate open source uh, architecture same time so you can use delta lake sharings ml flows apache spark uh Rexus, and their multiple component frameworks are directly infused in databricks dna and with, when working with an azure it's really enhances the architecture out there it's just it just complement that the scale or the magnitude that you want out there you can use uh to extending your catalog and managing permission access management through azure active directory out there <clears throat> there's always a question that what we can use for out there there's always a question out there that uh, what is the uh, azure <laughs> Databricks is used for out there. So customers use Databricks for processing, storing, cleaning, sharing, analyzing, building models, or uh, monetizing the data sets and solution for BI and ML solutions. So building machine learning models and using a presentation layer. So they're being used for the both purposes out there. Tools many faces. <coughs> Just remind me of the, something from Game of Thrones. So <coughs> yeah, it has many faces. And uh, so it helped me to basically build and use and compatible with so many different applications. You can see here, deep machine learning, stream analytics, data warehousing, and compatible visualization. It do have an integration available with multiple types of storage components. So it can read data, ingest data, write data from various endpoints. So structured data sources, such as SQL, now it's called Synapse, <coughs> or real time data sources like kafka or event hub hadoop resources like data lakes or blob storage so it have interactions available with these components out there so you can use this to apply many tasks out there and the people the multiple engineering teams can basically participate data science team can use our uh, ml lib libraries microsoft has something called, called machine lear learning library so you can build machine learning experiment and tracking them and use in memory processing at the same time so where the data engineer can provide you a transform data so data is available for you so they can collaborate on a feature engineering side okay in the workflow of data science <clears throat> Data engineers can help, uh, this tool can help them a lot to be, by providing them multiple tools. First of all, serverless, integrated IO, and workflow management. And the best part is a workspace. If they have a capability to run Python, Scala, Java, Python, and uh, SQL. So they have lots of languages and tons of open source and Databricks libraries that can help you to create a phenomenal transformations and enrichment of data. And those powerful languages, those powerful libraries really help you to just um, uh, transform the data the way you want. You can just crumble that data. You can just reshape it out there. And there are other people's main track out there. So this can be treated as a feature. Um, you can say the feature store in a data engineering perspective. It is integrated with the GitHub. So everything is declarative. So it's completely compatible with the CI CD pipeline, or I say MLOPS, the buzzword. <laughs> So that's the most common use cases out there. But today's my focus, it's more on the main concept of Databricks out there, which is basically ETL and data engineering. When you talk about the ETL out there, so when you are basically generating dashboards or building some kind of artificial intelligence application, data engineering provide the most important segment. Data engineering basically provide you the data in the cleansed form that, and because those companies are data centric nowadays, and they provide them an easy way of data discovery and provide them a data in a form which they can compatibly use out there. They can retrain those models out there. This logic can be scheduled and on an ongoing basis can refine out there. They are declarative out there. They simplify this method by using the new new product or new new feature in Databricks that call Delta Life Tables. Delta life tables simplify the ETL even further and by intelligent uh, in, 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 in its core out there. It's very intelligent systems. Between data sets automatically deploying and scaling to the production infrastructure, it can be a time consuming task, but data lake can do this thing, or data bricks can do this thing more optimally by using the concept of delta life, life tables. They also have advanced and customized tools for data ingestion, which including autoloader. <clears throat> that allow you to ingest data with a, a quick scalability in mind. And it's kind of like an item potent tool, which means regardless of the number of time you run that tool, uh, it will generate the same results with the same consistency out there, it will not change things out there. It has graphs and charts and have so many data governance tools, and I can really talk more about it, but I'd like to go 
quickly for the rahat. So this is <coughs> what, uh, the holistic view of data breaks in my mind. So first of all, enhance productivity. First of us can collect data from various endpoints, batch processing endpoints as well, and it have sources, data sources, and it can also stream data from real-time data sets as well. Data engineers can get the data, make it available for data scientists. They can build machine learning models, create a predictive models, create a prescriptive models out there that might be can be compatible or usable by the data analysts or business analysts as well. <laughs> they provide us a multi-stage pipeline and scheduling mechanisms and notifications in a single place out there. They don't have to deal with all Spark nitty-gitties. You don't have to deal with a Spark at all in the certain scenarios out there. You just use them as a backend engine. <clears throat> you can configure your requirements <clears throat> at the same time, but the management of infrastructure is being on an overhead on a cloud solution provider. In our case, Microsoft. Similar version of that product is available in AWS as well. <laughs> it has also optimized runtime for Spark that basically called as uh, Azure Databricks runtime engine that has a compatible uh, party Spark flavor, serverless, REST APIs, and advanced IO capabilities. And that's what make this Databrick uh, is super or trustworthy or super scalable out there. <laughs> so, <laughs> So you can see that they, it can basically handle any kind of data to be processed out there. So data can be in Delta Lake, data can be in any format out there. So it can be structured, semi-structured, or unstructured data. They just put them on a data lake out there. And then we refine the data into multiple phases out there. So we create a streaming pipelines, we create a SQL analytics to just basically perform some analytics out there and then use it for next layer. <laughs> Now, you guys might also like to ask a question that what is a Spark? <clears throat> because I have talked about it, the store, train, machine learning models and all that, and uh, talk about the data breaks in general as well. But what is Spark? Spark is open source data processing engine built around a massive speed for sophisticated and advanced analytics that provide in-memory processing. It's an in-memory engine that can be a faster uh, 100x faster, and, and, and when you go for the data bricks, it's a, that people say 500x faster than anything else, <clears throat> even uh, uh, their own predecessor uh, of uh, Hadoop Mapper user jobs out there. It's the largest open source data project with more than 10,000 contributors. It's been used widely across the globe. It provides a high scalable infrastructure uh, that can basically allow you to use a multiple compute machine and distributed architecture to process data. And not only for data, you can use a machine learning libraries for distributed architecture to take an advantage of it as well. It allow developers, data scientists to work along the same side out there. So it will support multi-language Scala Java, Python. So you can use these languages to write the code or submit your jobs out there. And you can use uh, analytical tools like Graph X or SQL X as well. And these tools are really helpful out there. So first, it have a data frame library. It have a streaming capabilities. It have a machine learning capabilities. So it have an MLLib that called Azure Machine Learning Capabilities. And then the third, it have Graph X compat compute computational capabilities. So when you talk about it, the MLlib libraries, the MLlib libraries is consuming the most common algorithms and utilities for classification, regression, clustering, collaboration, filtering, and much more out there. So TensorFlow and many others are by scikit-learn. They are also available in a compatible version of Spark. And it can stream data. This is how we look alike. And Spark unify a couple of things in a single picture. Spark tried to basically simulate many things in a single picture out there. And Apache Spark, it's one of the most advanced and the most popular uh, tool for, uh, I think there's some course, no. Sorry, uh, Spark is one of the most popular data processing tool on planet at the moment out there. Not what breaks, many of the companies is leveraging this out there. For batch processing, processing a large amount of data in small batches. And the interactive SQL, which means that it has a SQL style structure language that allow you to interactively query on real in-memory data. So get the analytics done. 
real-time processing. So it has a capability to stream data from an ongoing processing out there. So the Windows-based ar Windows architecture, uh, different times series architectures out there will be available that help you to just process that. Machine learning, deep learning, graph computation, all that in a single tool out there, which make it super powerful, which make it super compatible as well. And uh, Apache Spark, it's a basically evolution of an, uh, uh, or need of the Hadoop architectures. And at the core, it basically use Mapper uh, some, uh, RDDs that call resilient distance and uh, uh, that basically provide uh, a distributed architecture of uh, processing large amount of data and let us run the computation as well. GraphX is getting very popular nowadays. So GraphX comes when you select a distributed algorithms for processing graph structures. And it has a quite nice number of libraries that everybody can use out there. Okay, <laughs> so, the store is in memory, so how long the life cycle of the information is up? So there are multiple pieces uh, <coughs> out there. So we do have, a, since it has a clean data architecture, you can process data and make it available in memory as far as the data is living and running in the cluster. And you can write back the data in the serving layer after completing a job, so it will be available for long-term purposes out there. So we you use that one for the processing as long as the spark clusters are spinning up we have this data out there and we can dump that one and reload them as well whenever we need it as well yeah <coughs> the cost <coughs> is an expensive product so it's an expensive product and uh, it is basically use a combination of uh, azure azure infrastructure so databricks is also using their own licensing so you have to pay for databricks license along with the infrastructure that you use beneath databricks like computational cost from azure vms and fucking ingesting and uh, uh and ingressing across data at how much data is coming in and out from azure and uh, where it being consumed so the, the cost is really very in this particular segment out there. So it do provide a structure streaming. As I say that, the data will be available in structure stream. And uh, it's same as the spot, same as the spot, like the snap. And so data will be available in memory for sure, but it can be really right back into the in a very optimal um, way of uh, aggregated data can be right back as well. So into the some other systems or on some files as systems as well. It's very compatible with an uh, Avro format and the Procret format, which basically allow them to write data on the file system or a distributed data lake in order to, if you want to process further, or you want to resume the processing as well. And uh, so, or you can just put them into serving layers. <laughs> so <laughs> if we try to, <coughs> Sorry, <coughs> and just to be clear that the data is the resulted data when you talk about it. So database, database runtime, it's a something that add value on top of Spark. So you have a proper Spark and database, it's add its own runtime. And database runtime, it's basically designed for cloud optimization and infrastructure in, uh, best practice implementations, which optimize its IO as well. So it add the optimized layer for IO, for data processing and reading and writing purposes out there, in and out purposes out there, that call Databricks IO. That's basically the power that make it Databricks so fast as compared to general Spark processing out there. According to Databricks, this is just, it's, it's 5x faster. So you can process a, a same amount of data in fraction of time as compared to what you can do on Spark because of this optimal behavior of uh, of uh, data distribution architecture they created for Spark <coughs> through Databricks IO technique. So in a general world of uh, machine learning project, so how it works is first we basically ingest the data into Databricks store and they, we have a Delta Lake tables. We also have a, a file systems. We can also link these tables outside of the data lake as well. And once this data is available on the, on the machine, we can use this data for feature engineering. So training the data might be perform some sort of basic ETL here. Okay. So we're doing a feature selection, we're doing a feature engineering. Then we use some piece of data for training and scoring. And after that, once the model is ready, and uh, we can use Apache ML lib libraries. And uh, we can do this whole experiment by using data framework for data workflows. So it has a jobs which basically run multiple tasks and provide us a complete feedback around it out there. 
<coughs> so it's unified the whole architecture it just unified the whole architecture so developer can mix match a different kind of processing in a same application uh, with a common requirement for big data pipeline it provides you the in memory uh, the great data frame library so it's built on rdds and it has an improvement on the actual spark cluster which basically dominate the cost optimization as compared to spark <coughs> So, differentiated between Azure, if I say that out there. So, first of all, scale out limits out there. So, when you have is operate on a massive scale without limiting the globally out there, there are some limits at how number of Spark machines you can provision in, in a specific region. So, you have to just take a look out there. But it accelerate that data processing power, uh, and it's faster then Spark, so the fastest Spark engine, then it comes with a Microsoft compatibility with Databricks, and it has a great integration to make it more uh, compliant and more compatible with the regularities and the uh, other concerns that organization have comes with an out of the box SLA. So you'd really worry less about it, about the high available infrastructure configuration. You focus on the main thing, you focus on a thing that matter most to you out there. So faster innovation and faster involvement out there. <coughs> this one is a most uh, simplified process here. So Microsoft and uh, Databricks have built something that called Auto Loader. It's a basically open source tool that optimizely load data from different tools out there. This particular tool that called Auto Loader. Auto Loader, it's the kind of tool that perform ETL processing, okay? Or they can say that it basically used to uh, process data or load data with optimal best practices out there. And it basically very efficiently load data because one of the key tasks of data engineering to optimize the load process out there. So Auto Loader incrementally and efficiently process a new data files that arrive into uh, data lake and once data lake files out there it use the new data and put them in processing them into uh, the, the data breaks so only the delta will be processed only the new delta will be processed so and it's do this thing in a very optimal way in a very recursive way and it's not compatible only with microsoft so you can use s3 you can use gcp storage you can use azure data lake and hadoop compatibility as well it support data compatibility with the multiple type of file formats like uh, SVC, Procut, Avro, and uh, OCR, text, <coughs> binary files, all of them out there. <laughs> so Auto Loader uh, basically discover the files and the read the persistent metadata. And the metadata is just like in a small file that have a key pair value. And from that file use is basically to determine that what particular set of files it have to upload to load out. It doesn't read a whole file, it just reads the header of the file, which basically provides them a small metadata information that you just use that what piece of files or what segments of files that need to be used in order to just get the new coming data. In past, we don't have that mechanism. That's why we load the whole file again. So when we have to process more data. <laughs> so and Microsoft integrate its event hub, which is basically the serverless edition of Kafka and that for the real time streaming. And here is our beloved Delta Lake architecture. So Delta Lake architecture help us to serve raw data, aggregated data, and uh, not edited, it means the transform data. And this one is an aggregated data available for serving. <coughs> so the purpose of me showing these advanced, um, these advanced uh, segments to you guys, or these reference architecture to envision, to just understand that where we are coming from out there and how we can use this, this tool out there. Because this tool can be used in so many different formats. Today, it's very popular with its own Delta Lake architecture because it's combined both layer, reduce the computational cost for streaming and a processing of the batch is batch data. It allow you to ad hoc queries. It allow you to use uh, for analytics and machine learning at the same times. And it has multiple advantages. So <clears throat> this one is a more enterprise architecture where I can see the Delta Lake format architecture available, basically leading a data from data factory and the real time data coming to dynamics out there. So it's loading a data from two points, one from real time streaming, second from a batch storage at same times. And they will be available again in a bronze and silver and gold tables here. And the gold tables, once it's basically processed out there, and then it can fan out. 
it can give to the application that you can use by the Kubernetes. It can be used then uh, from Cosmos DB for the uh, for serving layer and for highly distributed architecture, or just put them into SQL Server data warehouse or Synapse data warehouse, where it literally can be used for a uh, uh, serving layer out there, which basically can low latency and uh, uh, persistently available, more optimized for uh, read queries out there, compatible for the long-term storage out there. And it's keep refreshing. It's a recursive cycle. Okay, this keep happening might be every second, every minute, or every hour. The schedule basis or real time can continuously go on. <coughs> so, <coughs> this is a very quick overview of uh, what Databricks is. Uh, it's a very interesting topic. I really love Databricks, and there are so much things to talk about. But uh, why not? Let's change and see how we can forge and then come on come on come on come on too fast <laughs> there we go so we got an Azure here. We just log into the portal at azure.com. Databricks can be provisioned as a native resource of Azure. So it works with an Azure Resource Manager. So you can use PowerShell, CLI, command lines, ARM templates, biceps, whatever the method you should just suit stocker. With an the most intuitive way. I'll try to showcase you. Way that I like to do is just just search here, or you click here on in resource, and then click here on resource. It's kind of slow. I don't know why. It's terribly slow. <laughs> So, so if you basically uh, come on, just search here, or just click here on analytics. Okay, let's click here on analytics. You will find under the you will find under the analytic tabs database. If you sometimes it doesn't appear, and uh, if it doesn't appear, you can just search in the main global bar. Okay, database. So if I click here, database, Azure database. The whole spark is by default infused here. <laughs> if something goes wrong. <clears throat> what went wrong? <clears throat> okay. <clears throat> and we come up here. <clears throat> so it's very simple. You basically use your subscription here, select the resource group where you basically want to deploy this resource, put the name, okay? And then you have to select <clears throat> The location. Location is very important. First of all, where the compute going to take in place, where the storage going to take in place. You should be creating a data breaks closer to your storage, so it has a less latency and uh, compliance. <clears throat> so, and also the available quota for your subscription in this region for Spark and type of VM that you are targeting for processing, because Spark need multiple virtual machines infrastructure beneath that and Databricks will run on top of Spark. So you have to make sure that if you want a high-end enterprise grade production caliber uh, computational uh, units, it will be available for subscription. So be careful with it. <clears throat> so it's available in a two separate editions. One is a standard edition, and the one is premium. Standard edition of Databrick, it doesn't come within a role-based access control. So you can, uh, so the shared workspaces and the way you can have a collaboration options, they are not available there. However, they have an active directory integration, but not the collaboration features will be enabled. This one allow you to create an collaborated uh, environment for the workspaces as well with the role-based access control. So you can assign permissions and access management. <laughs> and literally there's not much, you just click here, create, and I'm going to create a resource for you. I'm not going to create a resource from here because I already have done this because it may take five or 10 minutes sometimes in this region. Uh, so if we basically go to the resource group before and this, this class, in the session, I already have created one Azure resource group for you. And uh, and also I have created the Azure Databricks. <laughs> so when I create a Databricks, 
<clears throat> it created two folder, two resource group. One, it's for managing beneath infrastructure for Databricks. So you get that called manage Databricks resource group. And one is resource like that. That's a resource that we will create in Databricks. So I'll just click here. <laughs> here it is. <laughs> And you don't see much stuff here, like in a, like in a vanilla as your source, because there's nothing here. Because data freaks have their own UI. Yes, they have their own portal. So you have to click here on launch workspace. And if anybody here for Synapse Lover, ask them to put this button in the Synapse. I already have said this multiple times to Microsoft Teams. Um, I like this button. Integrated with Microsoft Identity Management, so it can use my Active Directory for authentication and for. <coughs> Sorry. Well, we give you the quick overview of UI lookalike and interface. So from interface perspective, different from that. One version. You can see here you have a search options on the top as your branding here here you have an option uh, in this on the right hand side corner where you have a user setting and you have an admin console so these two areas sometimes you need for getting the tokens for example if i need to provide any settings that is related to user specific or api contest out there i have to come here so if you want to interact with an uh, api through api like integrating with the uh, let's say databricks or or might be uh, with an event, event hub, or you want to just integrate that one with an, uh, uh, any other mechanisms like Synapse, or you want to integrate that one with, uh, <coughs> with the GitHub, you can do all that. You can also integrate your repository management. Every code will you store here, it can either save into Bitbucket or GitHub, or you can see the bunch of options are available as your blog commit. So you can really use a complete CI CD pipelines here. And there are some editor settings are available here. So this one is kind of a hidden feature. Many people always struggle to find this. So just remember that it will be under your username. And here you will find under user settings. Admin is the Spark manipulations. So we'll not go there for uh, this particular one. It's just creating group and assigning that what they can do in roles. This particular segment is only available in premium capabilities. On the left-hand side, I do have an interface that I can basically select from machine learning, data engineering, or SQL. <clears throat> I have machine learning and data science. So this one is optimized for data engineering. <clears throat> Come on. So now I'm just going to click here. Uh, to the workspaces. Workspaces is basically like a shared workspace where developers and data scientists can collaborate, where you can create multiple users and access. Like I have created one, I can assign a permissions to this workspace and I have a complete access management. I can import a notebooks here, scripts here, source files, data files to just make it a one place where developers can collaborate with the data scientists and data engineers can create notebooks and work all of them together. Uh, they have a Jupyter style notebooks that call uh, BDC notebooks out there. So you can use the BD6 no notebooks here and you can create notebooks, libraries, and ML experiments. If you click here on the notebook and create, you'll find something like this. <clears throat> just use this notebooks in advance. So uh, in advance, just save some time. These are the some shortcuts. You can build your data pipeline, invite your teams. They can see little uh, shorts or something. I'm just going to stop this. You can click on it and get the tutorials if you are a learner. It's a great point to start. So I'm just going to click this cross icon, the cross icon, because I need a more real estate. 
So this is a notebook. <clears throat> okay, a cluster. You need a computational power to basically run these computer sources. Okay, where you actually the computer will run with then memory processing taking place something. And here I can attach my cluster. How I can create cluster? We'll go back to it. So that's one. And then you can create directly from here as well by clicking new resource. Okay. <clears throat> and uh, you can just run this thing scheduling out there. And here are lots of options for your file editing. You can just double click here and you also can edit the names. These are the individual cells. Okay. They run in a notebook style. And these cells basically generate these results. So if you can see this, these cells has generated these results. They're the persistent results. Even the cluster is not running. These results will be remain here. And uh, it allows you to debugging and develop environments and uh, build your code with it. And it's not only supporting a one language. In a single notebook, you can use multiple languages. That's the best part. So data engineer can use Python. Data analyst can use SQL and might be uh, or R. And uh, data scientists can use uh, Python as well. <clears throat> or data engineer can use Scala and data scientists can use Python. All of them can use all in a single layer it's integratable with microsoft architecture as well and uh, so we well, i'll go through what it within a complete demo in a second and uh, let me just quickly take you to the you can also upload and create delta lake tables and uh, that's basically uploading or connecting data sources to locally out them it has framework available for io and that framework gives us an opportunity that we can link uh, external resources that can be loaded in Databricks as well. So if you basically come on this screen under the Compute tab, you have option to create compute. So just click here on Create Compute. And this Compute tab, I just already have clicked them. It's waiting that it's going to be get started. So just delay. <laughs> so here you can basically define the policies. So you have an unrestricted policy, but for personal compute and different shared compute policies will be out there. Here you can decide the concurrency mode. So it's a shared mode or it's just for the single user. So decide the concurrency that how much, how the jobs will be processed around it, which user access you want to grant them. And here is the most important time. It's basically decided what version of Databricks you want to run. So I'm using here at the moment long-term support version of Scala 2.12 uh, and Spark 3.3. And that's one of the reasons that we come here, not go to Synapse because it support the all advanced and production ready uh, Spark additions here. And here I can configure my cluster. That's all I have to do. How it maintained behind the scenes, it's their responsibility. <clears throat> so I can define number of workers, means individual virtual machines behind the scenes in a load balancer or scale set. <clears throat> And define how many and how many maximum roles. And here are uh, here are the options which is available for me. The size of virtual machines that I can select for graphic accelerated or based on your subscription and location, these options will. <clears throat> you also have an auto scaling, so it means that it can automatically control the adding and removing instances as well. Or you can define thresholds. Here you can define the 120 minutes uh, of inactive time. So I have said that if the server is not active for 120 minutes, terminate them, which means this cluster is going to be stopped and then memory process will be going to be wiped off. And uh, but the data in notebooks will be saved there and it can be right back uh, into data lake architecture. So and there are some advanced options. Once you click here, create, you will be ending up having a cluster running total active memory is 18 28 gigabytes eight processors eight cores and the source is ui these clusters can be created through api this cluster can be created through scripts so and through deployment processes as well so you can uh, also have a workflow you can also find the workflows as well and where you can create an workflows for uh, your organization, you'll come back to it and how we work with that one as well. So let's go and create some basic demo. So in order to do this, I am going to go back to data source. So I have a data here. I have upload a small data set. 
just for this classroom demo or just for this particular session demo. <coughs> Let's take a look to my data. I'll go to in my data lake. This is my data lake stored. And the data is I'm using is very simple as the basic, which I want to transform in data. Experience where it is container. So this one is here. There's some radio data available. So I go for and so you can see some some session ID, subscription ID, login information, some genre. So that's kind of information you may see here. So registration first name last name length of the song gender etc it's a very generic data that people have asked for the the songs on the radio <clears throat> okay so it is nothing fancy or very special available here if you go back to my data bricks environment <clears throat> okay so here is basically uh, I'm going to just adjust this not here. So first of all, I'm going to create the keys. Don't copy my keys. FYI, it's integratable with Key Vault. So you can use the Key Vault and the database also have a secret store as well. So you can use store if you want. So I'll just copy the key here. If you can see, I'll just call the data one. So that's basically the container name. Storage account name. Here's a storage account name. Okay. And here I need an SAS token. Okay, get access token. Just insane. Yeah, I am. Finally. So here we are. And so we're going. To, oh no! 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 We're going to just, uh, I just hit enter, so it just has. If it put a shift enter, it automatically executed. <coughs> this is my new SAS token. I'm just going to delete the previous one. OK, so this is basically concatenated the my folders here. So here is this, that's my container. And uh, this is a container have one file. And in this container, I'm using uh, Databricks utility to connect that container with my Databricks environment. So here I'm just running a very basic uh, with the endpoints. So I'm just creating an endpoint. And if you click here on small button, it let you run the cell. So it just execute that one and make it available in memory. And this will be the results out there. Now I'm using DB utility file system mount. This will basically mount this particular storage on uh, the uh, Databricks uh, workspace out there so in for the contest and once i use this particular library help me to load data from uh, another locations out there so this utility is basically using io capabilities of data factory, data factory sorry data bricks so this will basically connecting in a in simple word i'm just connecting or mounting a data the word we use mounting of drive from external so just mounting a data lake here in this particular scenario so this is just mounting and connecting them with the scenario so <clears throat> once this and how this basically executing is behind the scenes is just running on the clusters and here we are so now you can see here that i have right in I am in Python as well. And here I am just using a Spark library, read JSON and giving the location here and load them in data frame. So it's just loading a data the way it come out of it out there. I can load from multiple files. There are multiple optimal flavors. And it load that one on the fly. This, is, this has been loaded on the fly. So it's in memory. You can see now it's in memory, it's loading faster. <clears throat> so I have this data available in this data frame. And if you look here, so we have artist, we have authentication information, first name, gender, item sessions, and there are lots of results. And 
as a data engineering pipeline or ETL pipeline, I don't need all this data. So first phase, removing the data that doesn't need it. So auth doesn't need it. I need first name, yes. I need gender. I need uh, location. So location will be helpful. And the label, the subscription type. So what I'm doing here, I'm just using a uh, uh, Scala and the library data for, uh, this particular data frame library or API allow me to just use a select and create a subset of that data set out there. So now I'm creating another data set or another data frame out of first data frame by using select command. You can do this thing by using uh, SQL or Python code as well. <coughs> I save there, I use a display command to sh showcase them in this particular table. And here you can see a squeezed model. So ETL is started. So we extracted the data, we loaded, and now we are performing the basic level of transformation. Let's do some transformation here. Change this one with the uh, name of subscription type because label is not, it's basically a subscription type. And uh, so let's run a second line. So I'm using again data frame library memory. It's happening so fast. <coughs> you can create structures. I have a few more demos I have. And here you can see the jobs that is basically created, how they are processing. So you have a complete uh, troubleshoots available, complete telemetries are available here. And here that information came out of it. And look at here. Now I'm going to rename. I'm going to rename this. I'm going to rename this particular data frame. And uh, so I'm just going to say create and replace the new data frame. So just click here. And now I will run the surprising thing. In the same sequence, I am running Spark SQL. This is select static count as count subscription type from rename because I have renamed the view here and that's cool. And I'm using a currently Scala library to send SQL. <coughs> and I run that and uh, use this information in an aggregated form. And I try to display you the aggregation. Okay. And this will be definitely the same. So now, how I, the, our results come like this? No. Why the results come in graph? Because I can create visualization here. So I can create multiple type of visualizations here. So, and that's, that's, that's the best part. I can just see the simple tables. I can download the data. I can just <coughs> do whatever I want. <coughs> so this particular uh, graph is basically created from here. And I can just change that one as well. Let's say line chart <coughs> or let's say uh, bar chart. <coughs> so the information the way I want. And I have this field symbol. I can use some basic level of aggregation, whatever thing suits to me, and I can apply them here. And I can convert the any table into this, and I, it's very interactive. So data analysts can use R and Python and Scala and, and multiple languages in order to create multiple dashboards here. <laughs> now, i done my aggregation, okay? The aggregation is done. So now I want to write it back. I can write back the data into the serving layer. This, I can be write that one back into data lake. Okay, in this scenario, I'm writing back to data lake by using a command line data frame, have a built in library to write, write mode overwrite. So if it has anything, and it's just going to be partitioned. So it will be partitionally distributed. So optimally optimized for reread again in a data brick format. <coughs> so if I go back and refresh the containers, okay, in here we go. Output form. This is basically the output is created by my code. This is the aggregated CSV we have generated. And here you can see this as aggregated SVC has one file that have a 16 MB and all other ones don't have much data here. And uh, if I open it, it will show me the most of my results. So it do a partitioning. So it just basically optimizely divided the file into smaller chunks that it will be available for further more use. <laughs> And at the same time, it's just it's cluttered in the, the information here. You can see this just completely aggregated information out there. And I can do a repartitioning of that one. So it's a single line ETL process. In a single line ETL process, 
you can see here the complete end-to-end -end cycle how we read the data process and dump them somewhere and we can use a multiple languages at the same times so we can use multiple flavors at the same times as well let me take a slightly advanced demo let's slightly advanced demo and this will be the last <clears throat> so first of all we're using here the another data set so if do you use the online? So these are some sample data sets that come out of um, Databricks. So this is basically songs data sets out in. And I just use the display, utility, file systems, list the data sets. So I can see there are three files available and two folders, data 01, data 02. <coughs> and this files is already available. So what I have done, I have opened these files and I apply the joins and I can see the list of file attributes which are available here i can see the list of file attributes and then i just see the path of those files that how those paths are available and list of files that are available in this particular folder and then i'm just joining them all together in a single data source so i can read them all together this one's here so that's all this particular script does okay this showcased me that the data does exist that i can use it here if i'm going to shoot the second step, the second step of this particular phase, not space, is just to evaluating our data. The second phase is ingesting our data. This one is data ingestion called uh, processing out there. So here we're creating a structure schema. So that's like a schema that we want to produce. And, uh, and here we're defining the path. Here we're defining the cloud files format path. We can define SVC paths and multiple type of format, SVC format, Procret format, Avro format, based on what we want. And we're passing this information so it will convert the loaded data into structural and strongly language data frame with our given types. Because when we load data, when we load data by using data frame library, it just use data and try to intelligently find data types. But for suppose there are some strings that look like uh, numeric values, it will just remain string because they have tax value. And But you want explicitly to be used them with your given data type so you can create a structure. <clears throat> so I'm using a streaming here and here I am just providing path and I'm start streaming. Streaming means it's continuously reading the data from there. Second, <laughs> phase of this one out there a second step it's being in particular step it's all about how we prepare our data it's data preparation stage so here we are creating our table here we are creating our table and uh, in this particular table we're going to convert our raw data out here. So we're creating a in-memory table here. So we're just going to give the name to our table. Okay, so let's say we get prepared data pipeline and this will be the creating a table, just structured here. And then inserting a data that we have just loaded in memory out there. So insert into this and select from stream and where basically the raw data is coming from. So, so where the raw data is coming from, we can just get this data out there. So why? Because this data when I we loaded in our previous Excel example in a previous example we quickly clap because they are connected that's how we created the multi steps uh, come on there's I don't know why they are pretty slow I think it's because of steam yard <laughs> oh sorry it just keep buzzing up on me uh, step number two, where we basically ingest the data. So when we ingest the data, it's come out of raw. It's completely raw. Okay. And here is basically my table name. So that's called uh, pipeline get started raw name. And when I just creating here, I just convert into the table. So whole data sets will use this structure, structure and convert them into this table that will be available for the contest in the same process. <laughs> We go to the same process, second, uh, second, third process we already have seen, and um, <coughs> that we get <coughs> creating a pipeline here. So there, here we're preparing our data. We're putting our data into a delta table, so it will be available for quicker and processing out there. And fourth step, the fourth step is the data for analytical purposes. The purposes, and here I'm just using this uh, magic. Uh, 
markup that calls SQL sign here, percentage SQL sign, that means a script beneath script is SQL. And I just have select here SQL as well. So I can just use either this or I can just simply select here SQL. <clears throat> here I am just creating a new view and uh, where I'm just selecting the tables from the source prepared data and defining that less than greater than zero here. And then here we basically uh, to see the release you know, every year. So just doing some a group by count so we can just see the newer data that's come only the only newer releases so we have our two data sets available here <laughs> once we process i'll showcase you one by one on processing them so and once we basically run those scripts <laughs> and then last step <clears throat> the fifth step it's transforming our data <laughs> so this etl will complete so you were creating another uh, form here and uh, you can see that's the previous script that we have created and here in this particular segment if you have noticed out there in this particular segment we are basically creating a view we are creating a view here that we're creating a, a transform data here we try to create a transform data that's only selecting a specific information because we're doing here some addition here it's creating by count selecting by the artist and group by for air and the artists in air as well and that aggregated view will be available here that basically we're going to use and then later on we're going to just use for the theory out there <coughs> so this is kind of like an etl process that we want to do but we can take it further we can just dump them in some other point but that's not the main goal of our exercise reason why i have these two multiple stages okay i can also run this thing uh, manually manually one by one but if you want to create a workflow because pipeline means something that automatically in a auto or sequentially it can run so how we can create a pipeline with these scripts we have the task we have these three notebooks where each data engineer will work on their given task and let run them one by one <coughs> so i run the my first one here just for testing purposes And then I'll show you how you can kind of workflow with that one as well. I'm not going in a very depth of the code or API, how you can work within a Scala, how you can work with a Spark API. There's a whole big bunch uh, areas out there with this libraries that data frame offer tons of facilities that you can use. Of and so capability that might be not possible in some other tools so i can see that this task has been run and this will be available there's first screen let's run the second task in step number two sorry step number three step number three step number three we are basically we are just uh, Creating the preparing the data. We already prepared the data and we're just ingesting data. Remember that. So I'm just putting them into delta lake tables. <coughs> and this will be basically executing. So the first phase was just creating a structure. Second phase is basically preparing the raw data and writing them into delta lake. <coughs> Here we are writing back into the delta lake. And I have only two machines. So you can see here the number of rows effective and it's put them in total. Okay. I can just download this one as well if it's needed in the frame. And now I'm going to run the fourth step because step or the task is out there. Okay. And I'll show you how you can connect them through automation. Here I'm running my SQL script. It's a very vanilla script. Okay. Let's run this script. Getting out. And uh, from this, basically, we're performing some aggregation. Here you can see the aggregation is came out of it. So I can see the airs and number of songs by individual artist. That's fantastic. And the fourth and the last piece is basically the last step is just using that one for the furthermore query out there. Just using that one for four more aggregation. It's a similar thing that what we have seen earlier. So first query query will run. <coughs> Show us a sending order. Cool. Same results. And now we are just going to summarize them more out there. And we also limit them within 100 as well. So here we are just creating a new view 
where we have more summary out there. So you can see that in this particular summary, uh, we have artists, we have tempo, we have the pipeline here. And because we just get this information from here, and now we are using uh, uh, danceable songs out there. So based on this number of size of tempo, we can all so because this one is getting more prepared data, the, uh, the data fair frame that generate this one as well. So we have a two data frames that we uh, use here. One is for prepared and one is for transform. So this one is transform, which basically provides number of songs by the individual artist in each year. This one basically provides us a danceable song, which means that they have a larger, higher tempo. So we can just move our hips on it. <coughs> so that's not a big fun part. You can see here that very fast and very quickly is applying these things out there. How you can orchestrate that one in a pipeline. You go there and click here on new under the workspace and you will find here option for the job. You click here for new job. So it has a workflow man. Give the name for this job. Okay. Let's say live demo. Live demo. Workflow. And here you select the type. So you can really use the Python scripts, <laughs> SQL scripts, Delta Lake pipeline tables, and JAR. So because Databricks is built on Scala, Scala built on JVM, JVM runs by the Java. So that's how the architecture goes. We use notebooks, okay? And uh, here is the notebook that we have. <coughs> Define the path that you basically want to use, for example. <coughs> here I define the path. And here I have to select the shared compute, which basically I'm going to use and process this data. <coughs> and let's click here, create. So, and once you're able to create this, okay. That's a first task in the pipeline. It can build a pipeline. Let me add another task here. It saves sometimes. I already have add one workflow for you. This I can demonstrate. Okay. When I click here on this icon workflows, and here you can find the ETL demo workflows. You can use this workflow from here. And I can just run this workflow from here. Okay, I can run and I can parameterize that one as well. I can monitor, I can schedule them as well. I can define and configure different kits. So it literally can use so many things. I can just click here, run. It's going to create and process. You see, these are three tasks they're going to run ingest, prepare, and analyze. So they run three separate notebooks in Databricks. But since we are in Azure, you might don't want to do this thing here. If you don't want to do this thing here, you do have an option that you go in tree. It's slightly a bonus round where we're going to conclude our whole session because we already click run it. It will take a little time to basically process this. And when you go for the data factory, data pipeline have a direct integration with uh, with with a Databricks as well. Databricks is used for advanced ETL processing, in my opinion, or for Delta Lake structure streaming out there, where you have to basically utilize the combination of a batch and live data together in a single table out there. <clears throat> data Factory is Microsoft product for data orchestration and data trust. It help you to build a data pipeline for orchestration, and it can also have capability for transformation as well. The best so you can use data to create a similar workflow what I have done here. <clears throat> so tables are already created in a memory, so we're not able to let me create it. I think I have to just so you can see that that the process. 
because I run all of them annually. So it showcases you the errors as well, that where it failed, which point it failed, not able to produce it, and then I don't have that much money. So, so failed. Uh, Find connections are not allowed. The additional details need approval. Resource manager locked. So I do not have, you see, because this is my trial subscription. I don't have much quota. So I don't have a maximum amount in West Europe. It's just a 10 virtual machines. And when I try to create a shared resource, I'm creating a cluster that has a more power than it's needed. Okay. So either I just modify that one and run that one that I already have, or I create something else. So, because Databricks is expensive and it's limited to many other capabilities. So, this neon is very heavy. Teams are not. data factors keep loading. It's very slow for some reasons. Might be you have to check the downtime, uh, check the status of the service. Always when you see this kind of slowness, come on. But we have seen this that you can create an available for if I want to show like, uh, some options that how you can call notebook in our workflow of data factory like we create our workflow here. <clears throat> I'll close the data factory. Sorry, data breaks. So I have some space here. Okay. And here, we basically, we can build a data pipelines. So if we go here in author tab, Okay, and if I click here, create data pipeline, I quickly create a small pipeline here. I'm not going in depth that what this tool is. I'm just showcasing you that, that how integration is available and you can see the data breaks here. Click here, notebook. Literally just drag and drop. I'll just drag one more time. Why not? Oh, come on. It's damn slow. <clears throat> and here you can just go under the property tab and select the data bricks. So you click here in a link connection, establish a connection. So I just use my own subscription where I have my workspace available and I will just use the existing interactive clusters. I can use the access token. So you need to provide the access token. And uh, so if you want to get in this access token, you have to go back to your data bricks. This is the access token, which I was talking about earlier. <clears throat> you can use manage identity, but access token is the simplest way because manage identity might be not available in other form of data bricks, but in AWS, so it will be different options. So if you go quickly under Sama's tab, go on user settings, and then you will get the access token. Click here, generate new token. Give the name, demo. One day, copy the token. It only comes once. Paste it here. There we go. So everything is on plan, okay. Okay, here's a cluster that we have. Test the connection, click here, create, and we are good to go then. So we link 
our Databricks here. And uh, if we go into the settings tab, we can just browse the notebook that we want to ship here. So we go for the users, Osama. Okay, give me a moment. I'll come back. Wait a minute. I'm on the phone. Say hi. Sorry, dollars. So, so be here and just let me just select the one piece here, the last one, because it will be it's still in the memory. And uh, we able to send directly from here. <coughs> okay. We create this pipeline, we publish this pipeline. I can complete workflow here. I can create a complete workflow and uh, I can add more stuff here. And uh, like I can just crack and drop uh, not only uh, items from Databricks, also other places and create a whole workflow here. I can pass parameters and uh, so workflow can be built inside Databricks or outside of Databricks, in Synapse or in data factoring. And uh, here we are, and we can use the same pipeline to be basically executed. So we come here. On, it's just very slow, some reason. Here we are. So you can just enable the debugging if you want, and uh, in order in order to execute this thing for the testing purposes. Or I can just add the triggers. So there's option here that add trigger now. And it will be basically going to execute this. And if you go for the run, so this is basically executing my pipeline. I can run on a schedule basis. Uh, multiple methods I can be doing out there. So. I can call this one for here as well. I can just let this particular workflow to be executed outside of Databricks because it's superly integrated with Azure and it's very easy. It's very fast. I able to do everything, whatever I want. Okay. So I have a great integration. I have a great infrastructure service support and all the VM creation, all the infrastructure support as a serverless, I don't care about it. It will be provided by the platform. I can work with the multiple libraries. I can work with an ML libraries and transformation libraries and Python libraries. So I hope so. this gives you a pretty nice idea about it, that what's Databricks in general, how we can use it, what kind of use cases it can be useful for it, and uh, why it's getting so popularity. If you guys want to learn more about data, uh, data, uh, data bricks. I'm uh, going to share lots of learning material over my Twitter handler and through Johan and uh, my uh, my fellow uh, co-leader of uh, uh, user group. <coughs> so, and uh, that's all. And if you have any questions, I will more than happy to answer that. Thank you. <coughs> yeah, thank uh, thank you so much, uh, Usama. This has been really great, and I really appreciate that we got some in-depth um, demos here. Uh, to show the real capabilities here of Azure Databricks. Um, I think we've actually covered the questions that came up here in, in the chat. So, uh, so let me just post here uh, as a banner here. Uh, this, is, uh, this is a link here to our Zoom meeting. So if you have any further questions or if you have any comments or you just want to discuss anything, you can just log on to the Zoom after we finished here uh, in a quick while here. Um, but do you have anything, uh, anything more that you would like to uh, say here to our audience regarding Databricks? Uh, if first of all, for learning path, if I say that, that we're going to definitely share the things with you and um, uh, and uh, so, Databricks is uh, very popular, and uh, I will also provide some of the link that is uh, about the cost because cost is subject to a couple of things and uh, the pricing of Databricks and especially which edition you use. If you're using, for suppose, a premium edition, so Microsoft use something that called DBUs, Data Databricks units. Yes, Databricks units, what they call it, and it's zero point thirty dollars per hour, so or zero point thirty dollars per DBU something, and then that cost of actual computation beneath that. So there's some mm -hmm. costs you have to pay to Databricks and the libraries that you use out them. So I'm going to put the Databricks official uh, calculation options where you can see that how you can evaluate the Databricks options. 
Um, how can I pass this information? I can just put them in a private chat. Yes, uh, post them in the private chat, and I will post them oh, over here. Yes. Sorry, I didn't see the message. Yeah. And that's all for my side. And thank you for giving me so much time, Hacken. And thank you, Johan. And thank you for all Scotland and the uh, Sweden community and all around the globe for having me here. It's an honor. I hope to see you sometime, other. And uh, thank you. Thank you for that. Yes. And we also got some appreciate, appreciation here from Tommy, who says, Thanks for a great session. Really liked the demo that gave a good insight on how to work with data uh, data works. So with that said, I uh, would like to wish all of you a very happy happy weekend, and um, I'm looking forward to see you uh, the next time, and also see you hopefully in the Zoom room in just a short while here. So thank you, thank you so much, everyone, and have a nice weekend.